please welcome Calder Zwicky and artist George Anthony Morton. George Anthony Morton, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. So, so we're going to do a Q&A, and then we have some time for the audience to ask questions as well. So we were in the Marking Time show earlier, looking at your piece, Mars, 2016, Portrait of a Young Black Woman. It shows up briefly in the documentary. I urge everyone to see it if you haven't seen Marking Time already. It's beautiful, and it's a beautiful part of the show. Thank you. You talk about how it's inspired by Velazquez and his mm -hmm. portrait of Juan de Pareja, mm -hmm. who was a slave working for him, but also a painter in his own right. Yes. You have a quote from the wall text. You started by kind of working in the vein of Velazquez, but quote, Something happened when I dared to paint a black Madonna from my own race, whose nickname is Mars, but her birth name is Miriam. What is it that happened? Well, really just an epiphany, ultimately. So like, just an epiphany. Well, it was a lot of surrounding uh, events that culminated with that epiphany. But I'd say, yeah, a lot of growth happened. A lot. It was just this very revealing moment about my place in this tradition, and it's something I was kind of searching for at that time. And the epiphany happened in that um, basically Juan de Pereja, the uh, slave of this 17th century old master, he's like the, the Rembrandt of Spain, basically. Um, he was contemporaneous with Rembrandt, who was just in the Netherlands, but in Spain, he was that guy. And depending on when you catch me and you ask me who's my favorite artist, how I feel that week is gonna go between Rembrandt, Rembrandt and Velasquez. And so you, you probably saw the show, me standing in front of the show at, at the Rijks Museum. It was this landmark, Rembrandt. Velasquez show, and I happened to get enrolled in this really great school, and the people that would open it, the teachers who were, who were my mentors at the time, literally traveled here from Madrid, where Velasquez and his slave lived. And they worshiped Velasquez. They really impressed him on me even more heavily because they would visit the Prado like it was church mm -hmm. probably weekly. They, they loved him as, as well as Rembrandt and many other old masters, but they were living there and they would come here and open this school. And so they made sure to impress Velasquez upon me at that time. And it was around the time that the piece would sell. I did this piece and it would sell and I was still a student in uh, my second year of school and I was at the Met at the time copying the Juan de Pareja and if you notice the fall of light on Mars is similar, the hair, the treatment, even the technical narrative, it's a very kind of optical treatment of, of the model. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the epiphany had to do with, wow, there's, there's nothing new about um, what I was experiencing, because I had some pretty rough moments there. Um, and yeah, the irony of it all is um, the, the landmark show at the Met by this uh, slave of Velasquez was, um, given by uh, or sponsored, curated. Um, he, Arturo Schomburg introduced uh, uh, Juan de Pareja yes. to the Met. Yeah. 
He, and, and so the building in which we sit um, is inspired by someone who had a lot to do with this landmark painting actually ending up in the Met, a painting that deeply inspired the piece that's in the show currently here at the Schomburg. Yeah. And for me, um, very, very much an inspiration to my own personal journey at that unique moment at school and reaffirming what my role would be yeah. in this tradition. And yeah. maybe we'll go further into some yeah. of that. I mean, can we talk about your time at the Florence Academy of Art? I mean, you have a quote in the movie, carrying on a tradition into the future that people like me have never been a part of. Right. Black artists, formerly incarcerated artists, what did you mean by people like me? Well, yeah, like in you know, the time of from the Renaissance up into the 17th century golden age, Spain is what we're talking about in Velazquez's case, Amsterdam or the Netherlands in Rembrandt's case, um, black people in paintings, um, if, if so, as I'm showing my nephew, when, it, when you do see it, it's like this object of power or symbol of control of, and kind of looking up in like reverence of their white master. And um, at school, I, I, I didn't learn as much as I wanted to learn about the story of Velasquez before that. And then it hit me, and then I would learn about one other painter um, named Henry Osawa Tanner in the 19th century. But other than that, it just didn't exist. Yeah. And, and so it wasn't necessarily impressed upon me to study the lives of these people. And so the epiphany even happened from the first question around basically going into what would happen to these guys, Henry Tanner, who inspired the Harlem Renaissance in the 19th century. So many artists from America, New York, would go to France based on his inspiration, an African-American who would be painting in Egypt in the 19th century that kind of got lumped into Orientalism, yeah. even though this was actually an African-American painting in Egypt, painting in circles around yeah. a lot of the impressionist. Thousands of years before. Well, exactly. And so you have a, a, a 19th century guy, similar, uh, similar to Juan de Perea. You have Juan de Perea's story. And then here I am, the first African-American to graduate from a similar um, academy as Tanner yeah. in the similar tradition um, that Velasquez would come under. And I just began to see the, the symbolism. I began to see the kind of poetic justice of it all. And early on recognized my position within this canon yeah. that's largely white and male, yeah. um, which was a deep revelation for me at that time where so many people just don't know what to say or you know, kind of follow trends. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to root myself in something that felt timeless. Because yeah. it's a reason yeah. Rembrandt and Velasquez is on the wall 500 years later. Yeah. There's something else there. And I'm glad you brought up your nephew, mm -hmm. Treshawn. Mm -hmm. He, I, I think your moments with him in the, in the film are some of the most heartfelt and beautiful moments. Um, and it's obvious that you care very much for him and you nurture his talents and mm -hmm. are there for him and support him. Um, and I know you mentioned a Miss Williams in the movie, but that's about all we hear about your early childhood. Mm -hmm. who, was, who was nurturing you when you were Treshawn's age? Yeah, um, I would honestly say that that, that element didn't exist. Um, sometimes we don't have the ideal upbringing or a, a environment that would nurture or cultivate whatever seed of potential we have. And we have to find um, moments within that, you know, the dark, like you find things that you can become inspired by. And in my case, um, I didn't think I had much, but I would be able to look back on even the pain and see the inspiration in that. Yeah. Um, and so speaking to Treshawn, uh, his moment in there represents, like psychologically speaking, my younger self. Yeah. You know, in a lot of ways, I'm talking to myself um, when I'm reflecting to him. And he also would come to the school when I was in school. I wanted to paint him while I was in school. I ended up adopting him. And there was a moment 
where one of the instructors, I showed him, hey, I got my nephew in karate class because I had adopted him. He was practicing his katas and I had a recording of it from summer break and I bought it back and I was already telling him about my nephew and he made this comment that was so ignorant on his part. But at the time, uh, I, I mean, today, today's people would cancel someone who said the stuff that he said. <laughs> but he said, oh, great, now he can go start robbing people. And I love this person, that's the thing. This, this guy is my teacher, and he was really in a high position there, and I look, looked up to him. And so I, all these years, I would kind of defend it, you know, as just like, okay, he's just miseducated, you know. Um, but it, it became a, a poetic moment in the film, just naturally walking into the museum, showing my nephew this Dutch painting of, of, that appeared to be this little black boy stealing. Mm -hmm. Trayshawn has this like, resemblance to Trayvon, mm -hmm. hence the black hoodie. And so there's a lot of metaphor within, within the uh, imagery you see, but he had a tremendous role um, in my journey as well, coming to the school, and, and he, he made the film on many levels. Yeah, in but that sense. So, do you feel you were in charge of nurturing your own talent entirely? And how scary must that be? I mean, there must have been a moment when you realized, I am talented. I have a gift that other right. kids don't seem to have. Right, right. You're but then in charge of yeah. nurturing that also. Somehow, that's that's what. The, the plight for a lot of us is you have to summon that, that inner strength, that inner power. At the time, I didn't always um, recognize that it was this viable career option or that there was a Rembrandt that existed. Who, who, but one time, I, I, I went to Juvenile and I was getting my GED. This was before I got sentenced as an adult and would be able to go to federal prison as 19, 20 years old, I was in a juvenile facility, and I met this teacher named Sharon Rouvier, and she was um, this French lady mm -hmm. who told me, hey, when you get out, I'm gonna find you and I'm gonna take you to a museum. Um, and like Miss Williams, you spoke about the teacher like that, and you know, someone who I felt seen by, um, but Miss Rouvier actually followed up with me, and she took me to, to my museum, she came and, and access where I was at the time. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to show me Renoir's and, <laughs> you know, no. her own yeah. idea of, you know, great French art. French teacher. A lot of the French. Yeah. And, um, but then I saw this Rembrandt, the one that I'm copying in my hometown museum. Mm -hmm. That painting was there when I was Trayshawn's age. Um, and I could see why even I probably didn't feel welcome or why it, it did, there was no one that looked like me on the walls at the time. But even in that Rembrandt, when I first got introduced to that painting through her, that definitely sparked something in me yeah. that would keep <clears throat> or stay yeah. throughout my life. Yeah, and, and you just used the term like being seen, being seen by that teacher, being seen by that mentor. And you work in portraiture, and there's so many moments in the documentary of you sitting across from a family member, somebody that you care about, your, your partner, seeing them yeah. and then presenting what you're seeing to the world. Talk more maybe about the act of being a portraitist, about someone who sees people and presents an image of them. There's gotta be a, a high level of trust involved in that. Yeah, it, I, I, you, you raise interesting points because sometimes people do need to feel seen as well. And um, yeah, simultaneously I feel seen. I'm showing a film that's about me and, so many people throughout my life or aspects of my own psyche, right? And so even through the people that you say I'm allowing to feel seen, what you get to witness is parts of myself that I'm actually showing you through my own shadow work. This is my upbringing, this is my family, this is my roots. Yeah. But it's a tremendous honor to sit across from them and have them feel seen yeah. simultaneously. And it is important. Mm -hmm. um, that we have people that are the seers of the world too. And yeah, in, in the form of a teacher or a mentor or someone who spots something special in someone. 
But today, um, being able to reflect that back to the world with my own art, how I see the world, and you talk about presenting that, it's a good word because it's this idea of representational art, but there's an element of presentation as well because it hasn't been presented before. And it's not objective, it's not a photograph, it's never gonna be. Right. You have such a hand in how the final product ends up looking. Yes, yes. Do you think that it's a, a radical act to paint portraits of black faces, black bodies in this form, in this way? Do you think it's a political act? Without trying, apparently, I, I just kind of live my life and it's a political act. I don't necessarily, I don't know if you get the feeling that I'm trying to drum up the politics in the film. I could have showed you so much more, but ultimately I'm concerned, just as concerned with aesthetics and the things, you know, like beauty and other, other elements. But yeah, there's, there's a level of activism in that apparently um, but ultimately, for me, it's a, it's a lot of healing through creative practice. Yeah. It's very therapeutic, yeah. uh, me doing my own shadow work. Yeah, I, I think the therapy scenes were also really touching and really intensely vulnerable. Um, and we provide therapeutic experiences at Artistic Noise oftentimes for the young people we work with. There can be a deep resistance to that and mm -hmm. a deep fear about opening some of those boxes and looking into some of those spaces. Mm -hmm. Was this your entry point into therapy? Are we watching your first therapy sessions or have you been exposed to therapy prior to the documentary? It's, it's actually interesting. No, I, I, during that journey, um, it was so rough for me that I, I had to start doing therapy. It was like going and ripping the Band-Aid off an old wound. Mm -hmm. A lot that's coming out, like what transpired with my mom, my family, this is happening in real time, healing in real time, and that's the, an extension also of the artistic theory that I believe in, this verite, mm -hmm. naturalistic approach where you know, I draw from life because there's, there's um, something about the, the, the randomness of nature that's just spontaneous. Things are changing constantly. And the, the filming process was that way as well, yeah. on purpose. And, and the filming process, you mentioned multiple times in the film uh, how hard it is, I mean, rightfully so, I think, for you to trust people, right. given your circumstances right. growing up, what you've been through. Right. How did this filmmaker get you to trust them to create something like this with you? Like, how did this come about with someone with trust issues allows a documentary it's film crew question. to create a film like good, this? Good question. Well, I think there's a correction that should be made there. Um, I didn't let them do this. I, I was doing it when I met them. I kind of selected them. I was filming. You were filming yourself yes, prior to I the I was filming myself before I got to Amsterdam and would meet the person who I would co-create my film by. If you notice, there's a film by credit on here because I was very much the co-creator, but because of the politics of people being able to tell their own stories and how that goes in that art world, in that mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. I had to, you know, like so many people like Tanner lead with um, painting people that don't look like me or people from my own community. I'm leading with Rembrandt here to kind of have a bigger conversation. In that instance, I, I had to, co-create with someone just to kind of get in mm -hmm. but honestly speaking before I would ever get to Amsterdam I was filming myself in Florence and I had this thing um, because I was in school with Florence Academy of Art and I had also been incarcerated in Florence United States Penitentiary wow. and so I was just wow. I, it was I was doing this Florence to Florence concept right and I still have all that footage even and so I would meet these people and, and basically, um, it became even more of an apprenticeship with my Dutch filmmaker. I, I basically saw these synchronicities um, happening with uh, my life and the people I was meeting. And, and it, something felt right mm -hmm. about that relationship so that she was an aspiring painter and yeah. wanted to study like, painting with me. And I was already telling my story and wanting to explore the world of film and cinema. And so it was, we both apprenticed mm -hmm. under one another throughout that phase and somehow was able to co-create. Amazing. 
Yeah. And I know we're going to open it up to audience questions. Um, real quick before we do that, so the therapist asked you a really simple, straightforward question at the start. Who are you? And I'm wondering, looking at yourself on this film and where you were then when it was being made, how does your answer to that question change today, sitting here now? Who are you? Well, there's so many titles we can use, but just ripping off of the last point, I'm definitely now a three-time Emmy-nominated filmmaker. Um, I'll say that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, artist is a lofty title. Like, I aspire, you know, I'm still healing in real time. Um, and it's the journey of self-discovery is a never-ending one. Yeah. And on some level, at our core, we're all really still the same, and we don't change, too. You know, so there, there are things that change, and, and, and then there are things that will never change. But ultimately, I'm still very much on a healing journey that is evolving. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. If, if people have questions, please feel free to come up to the microphone. I see somebody right there. Hello. Thank you for sharing your story with us. It was very touching just getting to know your practice and your identity. My question is in regards to the changes within your own just portraiture style and how the changes in evolution of yourself and just learning more of your family has shifted, how that shifted your own approach to that. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Because, yeah, this the idea of the self, and I'm painting a self-portrait, which is so confronting to just sit alone with yourself um, and, and have that meditation going, and you're looking in the mirror, not using a photograph, and I'm sitting with a lot of demons from my past, and um, it's, it's definitely been one of the best things I could do. Um, but. As an artist, I feel myself growing. Um, but again, I look at all of this as they, they say, you know, that, that it's all about the, the journey and not the destination. And my artistic process is the same way. Um, I'm more into like this on, ontological idea of painting, like this idea of the journey and enjoying the process. And it's also healing through creative practice as well. And so I, I feel myself becoming lighter as I put the things that's going on inside of me down on paper or on canvas. And being a father to my daughter, um, this is definitely um, helping me to reparent parts of myself that maybe didn't get parented. Yeah. And I, I can feel the changes in that way as well. And as far as my practice, um, on a technical level, Michelangelo was 85 and it says still, he said still learning. He was quoted as saying that. So ever growing and learning yeah. at all times. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, listening to it made me think of the German poet Rilke and about how, um, even if, they're, if we're in a cell with no windows, we still have our memories and our nostalgia to be able to cultivate art. And one of the things you talk about is the inner world, uh, the things that, draw, that drew you to Rembrandt. But in your work, there's such a deep inner world. And so I'm wondering, how did you cultivate that when everybody was out on the outside learning how to fish and you were mm. inside? Um, where did that come from? Where's that inspiration? Where's that depth come from for you? That's a, another good one. Um, and, but I think in, within the question is the answer. How to co how I, where did it come from? I was inside of the belly of the beast in, 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 a, in, a, in solitude. And in solitude is where great treasures are found. You know, I, I wasn't out here with all the noise, mm -hmm. getting distracted, kind of like on, you know, that, that journey was a very, um, self 
uh, like or, or a journey of soul searching and kind of um, self-realization so that I spent a lot of time in a cell by myself. Um, I was able to read books that felt like they were written by the hand of God, mm. herself, mm. himself, whatever, however you want to think about it. I was learning and seeing God in the eyes of other men on the prison yard. So through them, he spoke to me. Um, she spoke to me this, this, and, and I was able to hear it, you know, and, and even just being alone in silence a lot and, and practicing, uh, having a practice, it, it has a way of, of giving you that, mm -hmm. you know, and so cultivating a, a, a practice of um, isolation mm -hmm. and the seeking the treasures that can be found there on purpose in prison in a lot of ways you can make a prison into a paradise or a, a, a heaven out of a hell mm. Mm -hmm. yeah novella we have time for one more question we do there's a young artistic noise participant standing up i'd be remiss if i didn't let her ask a quick question oh sorry and there's a woman in front of her too i'm so <laughs> sorry no no you so we have time for all three of these questions oh, perfect so okay. go okay. for it and then we'll ask hers and then we'll ask his excellent i didn't mean to jump you ma'am i didn't see you there go for it I'm so glad I came here to see this and to see you. Two things struck me that I wanted you to speak to. Um, as a black woman, I've, also, I've always wondered what that talk was that a young man coming of age gets, and it's the first time I've ever seen it. I wondered, did you get that? The second thing that struck me was toward the end of the film, you mentioned um, with your mom, I wondered, did you ever did you finish that painting? Mm. And I wanted you to speak to, you said, when I finish it, it's gonna seem like it's gonna talk. And from the three pieces I've seen watching this, is, is that a part of how you let them be seen? Mm. Mm. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, that, was, that felt healing for her and for me mm. to, to be able to hear her tell me what the circumstances surrounding my birth was even like. Um, yes, I'm trying to okay, get, get to all of your questions, but she, that, that was a, a very deep moment in that painting. Um, yeah, and I, I've been working on more of her as well. I actually moved her to Atlanta um, and continue to work with her even more because I try to do it in person and I could take photos and work from photo, but the hard part is, is to mm -hmm. do it from life. And, and certain times, some people just live in a way where it's difficult to get them to sit down. <laughs> and so I, I, I use that opportunity to spend time with my mom and, and mm -hmm. um, do that. And as far as the other question, um, no one ever had that talk with me until maybe I would get to prison um, because there were men in there who, uh, they were in there so long that I was their son's age coming in there and they didn't get to visit with their sons and they would um, kind of say things to me that they maybe wish that they could say to their sons. Mm -hmm. And I, speaking to my nephew, as I said, is this idea of like a letter to my young self. And this, this whole film is a love letter to future generations, ultimately. Um, and so these are the things that I wish I would have heard, like straight, direct talk. Um, and I mean, what do you say to someone who says, man, I, I, I don't, man, it makes me, that actually makes me scared now that's gonna make him get up, perk up, and feel like he can take it on. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you, that was him talking about the Breonna Taylors, the stuff that he's seeing on, on the news. These are real conversations happening in real time. And I just said to him what I would have wanted someone to say to me, mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah. Sir, and then we'll just, we'll end with her. You wanna? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'm Jamar, because I, uh, so I, I grew up in somewhat of a similar community, as, as you, similar household back in Arkansas. And I know I struggle with being in like a mental prison that separates me from like my inner child and purpose. And I'm just wondering, 
I'm just wondering how you were able to find that. You talked about the solitude while you were incarcerated, but I'm just trying to imagine, like, as you get back into a world that's so different from what you left, I'm just wondering how did you maintain that, that inspiration that you were going to find a deeper purpose in your work when there was so many things telling you that you were. Right. Yeah, that's an ongoing journey. Um, I'll say two things. Finding the right mentorship, people to kind of look to, I, ha I mean, it's, it's a lot of choices I can make. It's a lot of different trends and things that I can follow, voices that I can follow, but I, I felt like I, I was focused on like the right kind of mentorship and people that, could, that I could emulate or who had qualities that I felt like I wanted to have. And also, I would say therapy. Mm. Therapy has been um, very much one of the best decisions I ever could have made and having just having someone you could talk to about this stuff you'd be surprised just hearing yourself talk the things that that re it reveals itself unto you but the right therapist um, mm -hmm. and, and being able to make my practice uh, an extension of that yeah mm -hmm. and we're going to finish it with lauren one of our young participants at artistic noise um my question was similar to his um i was basically gonna by the way, I appreciate your work and you expressing your story with multiple people. Um, like, I was gonna ask how, how are you able to manage your anger, like your anger problems? Like, like yeah, basically. That's yeah, <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> you see me struggling with it throughout the film, you know, being really vulnerable and, and you know, how do you trust people to even do that is a really good question. Um, but I just wanted to, t I wanted to share that. I wanted people to see it. And after a while, it was like they weren't even there. You know, I became really close with my team mm -hmm. and people that I work with and we were friends. We would spend a lot of time without the cameras on so that um, when it happened, it was natural. But the, the, the anger piece is, it's an ongoing thing that I've had to, to um, release. Mm -hmm. It's things that I've had to release but at the same time, I, I want to reiterate this idea of healing through one's own creative practice. Mm. Um, a lot of what you see me drawing are, are the things that I'm probably suppressing, you know? So it's like a exorcism kind of thing going on. Like I'm working out shadowy parts of my own self, hence the title Master of Light. Mm. And it, it's gradually releasing it. And at, I still slip. My daughter helps. I look over at my daughter. Her name, Nuri, is not only the name of um, the place in the, where the Nubians come from in Sudan that helped create the civilization we now know as Egypt, but it, in Hebrew and Arabic, it literally means my life. So in a name is a function, is a nature of a thing. And so I look over at my daughter when I feel angry when I feel like you know I'm going to slip, and it's like instant light, mm -hmm. and so I, 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 things inspire me like that, you know, and and I still slip, but it's a it's a it's a process, mm -hmm. a work in progress, similar to the un unfinished paintings yeah. that we ended with. It's an ongoing work in process. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. As we close, I want to say thank you both for being here this evening. Thank you, George, for coming into town mm -hmm. um, and sharing your story with us, not only in this film, but here on this stage. Uh, thank you, Calder, for your really thoughtful um, questions that Very I think was questions. really helpful. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Artistic Noise so the folks will know? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. So Artistic Noise. We're a 22-year-old organization. Our offices, our studio space is on 129th and Adam Clayton Powell. We work with a variety of young artists, some of whom are system impacted, system involved, juvenile court system, but also the shelter system, foster care system, mm -hmm. mental health care systems, all of these systems that squash creativity, take young people away from their potential. Mm -hmm. um, we do art making in our studio space where young people, um, that back row is made up of a bunch of young artists in our community right here. <laughs> they're, paid, they're paid to make art in our space. 
$15 an hour for every hour they spend in the art studio with us. They also receive therapeutic experiences. And then we also, when we sell their work, they keep 100% of the profit. So we try and be a very equitable art. Thank you for that. Um, we are going to keep marking time in the Latimer Gallery open so that if you have not seen Mars uh, in person by George, that you'll have a chance to do so. Maybe you'll also join us in the gallery one last time. Um, I want to say thank you all for being such an attentive audience and for keeping your phones on vibrate. I appreciate that. Um, I hope that you will come back and see the entire Marking Time exhibition if you have not. It will be open until December 4th. We also have a Junior Scholars Program here, and they have a new exhibition down in our American Negro Theater, and we do some of the similar work um, with the students who come through that program. Part of their end projects are these art, so for some of the students it is artwork. Um, and so that exhibition has just recently opened. So when you come back during normal hours, I highly recommend taking, it, taking some time to come and see that. Thank you all again. The Latimer Gallery will be open until 9 o'clock p.m. So I suggest taking all your conversations that way so that you can also see some of the work that's in there. Thank you. Have a good night.